In the early 1990s, if you started a Formula 1 team, chances are you were going to be lumped at the back, many, many seconds off the pace. And then at sort of the end of the season or after a couple of seasons, if you were lucky to survive that long, something would be in the motorsport press or on Reddit 25 years later that basically said something to the effect of the money that was funding that team came from a place that was iffier than a student's fridge and then provides free content to channels like this. Because when Formula 1 dumped turbos and it went all natural in 1989, the grid size was unprecedented. Well, the entry list was unprecedented. I've said it a few times before, but I'll say it again. In 1989, there were 20 constructors fielding 39 cars, meaning that the pre-qualifying session was almost an event worth watching in itself. I've been over pre-qualifying rules too often, I don't really think I need to do it again, but basically they had to whittle down 39 to 30, and then the remaining 30 went into the proper session, which was then whittled down to 26. The 1990 season would be a tiny bit thinner on the ground, just 19 teams, but still the grid size was pretty chunky. The likes of Eurobrun, Lola, Acela, AGS and the short-lived Life team just making up numbers. But it would be the usual suspects into the qualifying session proper every single time. Which is why, in the middle of a season, the ones that were getting it often were given a free pass into the Friday and Saturday qualifying sessions, and then replaced by the worst performing teams over the previous half of the season. No pre-qualifying sessions happened at the end of the 1990 season because of life in Eurobrun going bust and therefore having to vacate their slots in the championship, but in 1991 it came back because two new teams had entered that would push the grid sizes back up above 30, so you had to take 27 down to whatever the last number on the entry list was, they'd then have to do pre-qualifying and then it all started that process again. One of those teams was Modena, or the Lamborghini team depending on how you look at it, and the other was an outfit from Ireland that had come up from Formula 3000. Jordan. Moderna was the latest in a long line of Italian backmarker teams, but Jordan wasn't like a lot of these other new teams. Instead of just trying to jump into the deep end with all the big scary sharks, you know, the likes of McLaren, Ferrari, Williams and Benetton, Jordan had been doing things... but well, I guess the operative word is properly. They'd been competing as Eddie Jordan Racing in Formula 3000, which evolved into GP2 and is now F2, and was called F3000 because the maximum engine size allowed was 3 litres. This was created in 1985 to give the final step up the motorsport ladder before drivers reached Formula 1, and many drivers raced in it over the years. The 1990 season had some known names in it. Eddie Irvine, Heinz Harold Frensen, Eric Van Der Poel, Alain Menu, Gianni Morbidelli, Eric Comas, Marco Greco, Jean-Marc Gounon, Damon Hill, Alan McNish, Carl Benninger, and so on, with other seasons producing some name drivers as well. Also on the entry list at the team's front, there was Pacific, Paul Stewart Racing, and Forty, who all entered Formula 1 at some point with varying levels of success. And in his Formula 3000 years, it seemed that EJ had the eye for talent, as between 1985 and 1991, Eddie Jordan Racing had seen the likes of Tommy Byrne, Jan Lammers, Johnny Herbert, Martin Donnelly, Jean Alesi, Ricard Rydell, Eddie Irvine, Heinz Harold Frensen, and Damon Hill all racing for him. In Formula 3, he'd had Martin Brundle on his books, and Etten Senna had tested one of his cars. Jordan's success in the lower categories had set the wheels in motion for Eddie to basically say, we're going to go up to Formula 1. But the problem was he needed to get a team together that can actually do what he needed to do and get some funds together and design a car that wasn't basically a canal boat with wings like a lot of the other backmarker teams of this period had been. Gary Anderson was Jordan's wingman for this, having worked for Reynard, which was one of the suppliers of chassis to the F3000 teams. One of those teams being Jordan. Anderson had also worked for Tyrrell, McLaren and Brabham in various capacities in Formula 1 and he would design what would be Jordan Grand Prix's first F1 car in his days off, as he was engineering the F3000 cars at the same time. Also on the design team was Andrew Green who worked the suspension and Mark Smith who did the gearbox. While those three were working on the car, EJ set about getting together some sponsorship and he had been trying to court Camel cigarettes for a time but, well... There was a little bit of a stun that EJ pulled in the F3000 days that I'm guessing Camel had remembered. This is probably my favourite motorsport story. Oh, apart from option 13, obviously, but this is... It's peak Eddie, really. So Jordan has Johnny Herbert driving his car, and Johnny was quite the talent who had worked his way up until an accident at Brands Hatch almost took his legs. Story goes that EJ had gone up to the motorsport guy for Camel and said, you need to check my guy out. He's good. You should really back him. This guy says, Eddie, I'm sorry, but we've allocated our budgets for the year. We've got no more spare cash. We can't take anybody on. 
No, 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 really. Look, this guy's name's Johnny, Johnny Herbert. He's brilliant. He's rapid. Come on, let me let me introduce you. Look, Eddie, my hands are tied. I can't do anything. I'm sure he's brilliant, but we've already given our money to somebody else. And that somebody else, I think, was Martin Donnelly and or Pierluigi Martini. No, 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 come on. This will be worth your while. He's going to win the championship. You'll see. Eddie, no. At least let me have a meeting with you. All right, when? How does Wednesday sound? <sighs> Fine. So Eddie goes to West Surrey Racing or whoever it was and says, um, lads, you got one of those big camel cigarette stickers. You know, the ones that you usually put on the side pods. Yeah? Can I borrow one? So Eddie has two of these stickers. He puts one on one side pod and the other on the other side pod. And Johnny goes out, does his thing. He wins the race. There are pictures taken of Johnny winning the race and the car and all that other good stuff. And then Eddie sold those pictures to Autosport, who put those pictures on the front cover of the magazine. The magazine went out on the Tuesday or whenever it was, and then the meeting was on the Wednesday. By which point, Camel had seen the pictures and they had to give him the money. They had no choice, really. I'm guessing this whole thing of no, we're not giving you the money was... Uh, the receipt, I guess. You know, some people never forget. And there's the stuff surrounding the name of the car. Originally, the car was going to be called the 911, but a certain car company in Stuttgart took exception to that. Eddie claimed he had to change the registration of the car with the FIA and some other bits and pieces, which he claimed would cost him a lot of money. In reality, it would have cost him 20 quid for the stickers, but as compensation, he got a free Porsche for 18 months. But, unlike a lot of teams at the time, Jordan had a physical car built long before they actually had to do anything with it, being able to get testing time and other bits and pieces. There is another story about Eddie booking Silverstone and then selling the testing time back to other teams with a bit of Eddie tax on top, but that's something else. But Anderson and friends had managed to design and build a car. They'd built this tidy looking thing that was also working at an aerodynamic level as well. Part of that being around the front wing, where the nose wasn't quite the low to the ground form that you'd see on things like the Williams or McLaren of the time, but it had this raised portion in the middle, which is basically the inverse of what the team started doing in the mid 2000s when the FIA said the front wings had to be raised. Some places online have been saying that the aero was quite advanced, I'm assuming that bit in the middle that I've just shown you on the previous slide, air went underneath that into the portion under the car and then was spat out into the rear diffuser. A rear diffuser that looks like it's come straight from the ground effect era, but whatever Anderson had done, it had worked, clearly. Some, and by some I mean Glenn Freeman, says it's one of the best looking F1 cars ever made thanks to its tidy design. The striking green and blue colour scheme also adds to the charm, with the car being painted green due to the team's Irish heritage, with EJ going after potential sponsors based off the fact they had green logos. Hence, the 7up sponsorship, since the Pepsi Corporation wasn't going to miss a few million quid if the whole thing went tits up after a few races. Another thing that made this car appealing to potential sponsors was the team was able to take it to the corporate offices. They could show them how the aero worked. They could show them that they had a proof of concept, and they could show these people that a car actually existed. They could see it, touch it, sit in it, understand it, and decide almost there and then, yes, we want to be a part of this project. Especially if you tell them that John Watson's just been lobbing it around Silverstone and setting decent lap times. In the end, EJ got backing from the Irish Tourist Board, 7up via Pepsi, Osama, the Italian calculator company, Fujifilm, and Shoei, Sh Shoei, the Japanese helmet maker. In all, Eddie raised about £12 million in sponsorship. Not a bad return for a brand new team. Now, powering this car would be a Ford V8 after a deal with Judd fell through, but that's not necessarily a bad thing because... Well, Benetton had Fords and they were doing okay. But because Jordan was a brand new team, they had to go through the rigmarole of the whole pre-qualifying system, and they had two drivers that were quite experienced at this format that would probably help them at this level. Bertrand Gascho and Andrea De Cesaris. Now, De Cesaris failed to pre-qualify at the season opener in Phoenix, but that was an issue with the engine rather than an issue with the driver. Gasho made it through easily and would be 14th on the grid for the race itself, and was running as high as 7th before the engine blew up on lap 75, which was enough for him to be 10th overall due to the whole completing 90% race distance thing. That would be points today. They had been beaten by the Modena of Nicola Larini, who was 7th, but things were looking good for this underdog team from Ireland, that was based in Northamptonshire. 
Despite the whole having to pre-qualify thing, the car was a solid mid-pack runner that would be knocking on the door of points. At Brazil, the cars were 10th and 13th in qualifying, but once again failed to finish. Gasho's engine blew, and De Cesaris was involved in one of the many accidents he'd have through his career. Imola was another double non-finish, but at Canada, the reward finally came. De Cesaris was 4th, and Gasho was 5th, despite being the two slowest cars through from pre-qualifying. And they'd beaten two long-standing teams in Tyrrell and Ligier to the punch as well, as well as finishing on the lead lap. It would be two fourth places in a row for the Italian, followed by a sixth in Manicourt. Gasho would get two points finishes at Silverstone and Hockenheim, with De Cesaris getting a fifth at that same German Grand Prix. But that was as good as it got for Jordan. They'd knock on the door of points for the rest of the season, particularly at Hungary, Italy, Portugal and Australia, while it was a revolving door of drivers in the other car, as after the Italian Grand Prix, Gasho was sent to prison for attacking a taxi driver. One of those guys was a kid from Germany, called Schumacher. Now the whole thing surrounding Schumacher is a little bit more complicated than the whole he drove at Spa, then drove for Benetton for the next few years, and there was also Alex Zanardi who joined for the final three races. I mean there was another guy in the car as well, but he's not important. But what is incredible to see, after the season concluded in Adelaide with no more points being scored, Jordan would be 5th in the standings with 13 points, essentially being the first of the privateer teams. And when I say privateer, I mean proper privateer, as McLaren had Honda, Williams had Renault, Benetton had Ford and Ferrari is, well, Ferrari. Eddie had turned up to Formula 1 with his ragtag team and beaten Tyrrell, Minardi, Lotus, Brabham, Arrows, who were footwork at this time, and Ligier, the latter two teams not scoring a single point. Meanwhile, the Modena team would have a best result of 7th with a 9th in San Marino. But the rest of their single season in Formula 1 is just a sea of pink with DNQs and DMPQs as they struggle to even make the grid. Given the likes of Life that had turned up and failed the year before, Andrea Moda that would be in the next season and those who had come before like Acela, Eurobrun and others, as well as the likes of Forty, Pacific and Simtech later on, Jordan turning up and being instantly competitive seemed like a flash in the pan and a total fluke. But it wasn't. It was just what happened if you treated Formula 1 seriously and did everything properly. Jordan would start the season with about $12 million and finish the season $6 million in the hole, which actually isn't bad. 1992 would be a rebuilding phase, cheap engines from Yamaha and also cheaper drivers, but from 1993 onwards they kind of found a bit more stability and evolved to become the team that everybody seemed to love and was Formula 1's proper underdog that, well, everybody loved. They were just able to perform on their limited budget and punched well above their weight for so, so long. The Modena team that joined that same year? They went bust after the season ended and they never came back. So then, a look at the very popular underdog that was the Jordan 191. If this has been something new for you, then do like the video so I know I've done a good job. And for more like this, get subscribed with the bell on so you never miss out on anything I do around here. Massive thanks to the channel supporters on Patreon and through memberships. And if you do want to support my channel at a more personal level, there is a link to Patreon in the description, along with links to Discord and socials, with the join and super thanks buttons underneath the video if you want to do that. Totally optional, obviously. Also in the description is a link to the F1 store if you want to grab some deals there, and then I get a kickback if you do buy something. So until next time, I've been Ada Maud, have a cracking day wherever you are, and goodbye.